this is a hard one to narrate. This uh, has really, I could go into so much detail using scientific terminology that I would prolong the length of this presentation. This presentation is about the possibility of Sasquatches living throughout the world. We, it's, it's a fascinating phenomenon. Just like UFOs, it captures our attention and our, our intrigue to have a little mystery in our lives. And I do believe the government would like to keep it a mystery. The problem is, is they can't do this forever. Number one, there's a tremendous liability issue. And I don't think the government has issues dodging liability, but they sure like to prevent having to do so in the first place. If you keep secret the existence of a possibly dangerous creature, and you encourage people to go into logging, um, sports guiding, you know, taking people on fishing trips, doing what they call outfitters, if you plan on attracting tourists for your hiking in your wilderness areas, remember an out-of-state hunting permit for a certain sheep can be as high as $5,000 for out-of-state hunting permits. So generating revenues from hunting is of interest of the state. Now if you were to have something more dangerous than a grizzly bear, then that would, in theory, discourage economic growth in the rural attractiveness and the endeavors that surround the rural and very, very sparsely populated regions of our national forests. Now, this story is about the people who did autopsies on the Sasquatches. It, from an inside point of view, we see what the federal government has really done, especially the Forestry Service and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We see what they have done and what plans they have made to deal with the issues that Sasquatches impose upon ever-growing population. As the destruction of territory continues, as we push out into the wilderness, more and more confrontations between wild animals and humans is in fact predicted and is now being seen. We have bears coming into neighborhoods where you've never seen bears. So that, that's just a symptom of what's going on, both with climate change and with destruction of habitat. So we see how the federal government, from an inside view, from an insider's point of view, how they've been planning to deal with this as early as the 1950s. The, the characters of this story, the doctorates, the masters holders, these people are the subject because it's their written record, theoretically and allegedly, that has documented this. Now what's interesting about these journals is we're looking at two separate journals from two different professionals who all write the exact same occurrences hand inside a glove. That's how well their journals match each other. One uh, anthropologist was a state employed individual from Texas. The other was a federal employee from Colorado but who work for the federal government. He will be the person I focus on mainly because he spans the most years in his journal. The, he writes that he graduated from Harvard School of Forestry and then went to work for a private agricultural company that was studying the hybridization of food. If you can hybridize corn to be bigger and more drought resistant, why wouldn't you try to select those plants? And why not try to hybridize those characteristics into traditional corn? He was so fascinated by this that he held off applying to medical school 
so he could gain more knowledge on genetics. He writes that his intention all along was to apply to medical school, and indeed he did in 1939, 1940. He applied for Harvard Medical School and was accepted. He completed all of his study there and became a licensed physician, and I believe he set up practice in Colorado. Shortly upon after doing some orth orthopedic type stuff and sports and employee medicine type of stuff, a lot of forestry people in Colorado. The federal government asked him if they'd like to, he'd like to come work for the federal government. They didn't want his personal research being kept personal. They wanted access to his research. It's intellectual property of the federal government, which he had no problem with. They, they're paying him. So he talks that he used to do autopsies and injury examinations on employees of the federal government who mostly work for the Federal Department of Agriculture and for the Forestry Department. A lot of burn people, a lot of smoke inhalation from the Forestry Service. Now today the U.S. Department of Agriculture is and has taken over much of our national forests. That is supposed to happen ber via emergency executive order. That's started way back when and it keeps getting renewed throughout the new presidencies. That states that under a crisis management or a state of emergency, the Department of Agriculture is supposed to take over control of all food sources. Anything that can be deemed a food source, they have the right to take and seize control of. And that's under the Conservation and Resources Act as well. Now, the the incredible thing is that one day they, they approached him and they said, hey, we, we need you to do autopsies on some ape-like hominids that we found in a cave complex on a plateau in Texas. Now, in Colorado, he was already privy to the Sasquatch mythology and reports by one or two of his patients that he examined for work-related injuries talking about the evidence suggesting the presence of a North American primate, a large bipedal cr creature. So he was flown to Texas where he met a second individual from the state of Texas who had a strong anthropology background. Both of them worked on these autopsies. She writes the exact same things as he does. He conf she confirms dates. She confirms all the details that he had wrote. There was no contradiction in terms of detail. They disagreed on origins of the species and the genetic lineage of these animals. She thought it, there may have been more of an old world lineage and he thought it was all new world based upon vocalization and certain anatomical features. He did not have access to DNA mapping and did refer that when the genome project was completed that we would be able to completely map this creature's genome. Now today we know it as being mostly human and just a tiny bit primate. According to the new DNA being alleged. Now the federal government for a couple reasons appears as this he tells us why it wants to be kept secret this this project. Number one, the animal wants to be secluded and doesn't want anything to do with humans and does not want to coexist with humans. Number two, the creature itself may be um, of superior strength and intellect that in the rural setting they may become an asset to the military. So imagine if you had a whole team of Sasquatches deployed in, in areas where there were enemy patrols. Now, and the enemy, I use the word loosely. The, so the other thing is, is there was a, more of a logging and paper industry back then than there is now. The mining was more of a boom industry than it is today. And so they did not want to discourage any of that by letting it out that there may be a dangerous creature that, that would rival the grizzly bear that was 10 times more intelligent 
and even more of a threat and then harmed, harmed more humans than the grizzlies have. So, you know, putting that out there that could discourage the, the development of resources. However, H.A. Miller, the gentleman who graduated from forestry, who worked under genetic program for a private agricultural company, who then got his MD at Harvard and then opened up a private practice and then was soon, soon recruited heavily by the U.S. Department of Forestry. What he wrote was that he, he had categories and he had names. He de uh, developed the family name of New World Apes. She did not think it, these were New World Apes. She thought they were Old World Apes coming from the land bridge in, in the Aleutian Islands. And he thought these were New World Apes coming up from Central and South America. The problem is there are no large primates. The largest primate up there was in Central and South America was in fact the howler monkey and there were other monkeys there was another monkey there too that was kind of big but not very predominant not very aggressive so the the howler monkey is where he developed his lineage be based upon anatomical features and the sounds that these creatures had made doing the autopsy in Texas at a very well-known cavern where a forest fire appeared to have burned and seriously injured three of these animals. She writes and he writes that one of them had developed, the, one of the youngsters had, had developed um, and healed over the burn wound so quickly that they thought the creature could still be alive based upon the rate that it had healed its wounds prior to its demise. He even questioned if it, the animal was even really deceased which they assured him that the animal was deceased. So anatomically, he examined these animals and developed a hypothesis on their origins and range and structural, structural, how do I say this, hierarchy of species. He developed scientific names for all of these species, species found across the globe. And a lot of them in their names, like like the ones in Texas, he, he called the species Texanus. He would name the species after the region in which they were found and noted several genetic differentiations. So for such differentiation to occur from a single species would take, and theoretically, evolutionary-wise, millions of years, according to Darwinism. So, he, so that's where he collided on theory. She fought very hard to make these new world order, uh, old world, excuse me, old world lineage, and he uh, argued that it was new world lineage, and basically he won out in terms of how they called and named these creatures. The female anthropologist who, uh, in her memoirs, the family has asked that her name be kept anonymous, she did say that they were going to recategorize all of these animals into one species and call it all one species, group it all together, and then have sub subunits in the families. The and you see some of the differentiations depicted here. These differentiations regard size, regard diet. He noticed the ones in the Pacific Northwest had less opposing of a thumb and more of a hook-like thumb to help them with their arboreal ancestry, to help them with their ability to climb and to gather. While the ones in Texas had an opposing thumb uh, and made them their diet more omnivorous than, than vegetarian. So the, he also noted the differences in the Asian and Australian the, the, uh, versions of this primate. He also differentiated the differences in the ones found in the swamps and the ones found in New York upstate and the ones found in the Northwest, all having various differences in either anatomy or vocalizations. He noted that the molars complex on these animals were they had giant molars 
that they looked like three of the molars were fused together into one molar. This would give it incredible biting power to, to uh, chew on, on limbs and sticks, but also for carniv carnivorous reasons as well. It's amazing, in her memoirs, she refers to Mount St. Helens incident, where the volcano in 1983 reportedly wiped out several Sasquatches. And there are extraordinary s stories being told about that incident. And the fact that she referred to it um, makes me really want to investigate the Mount St. Helens story, which is so out there, it's hard to believe that the federal government actually was able to communicate with these animals and speak their language, much the way that you would learn to speak the language of dolphins or porpoises. And, and you get their clicks and their squeaks and you and you know what they mean and you can repeat them back but that's another video so so the fact that H.A. Miller from the School of Forestry now working for the federal government that some of his federal records cannot be located that would not be a surprise in fact that would be a prediction that federal employee records just don't exist for work that is considered confidential, national security, or classified. He did write that they intended to disclose or semi-disclose the existence of these creatures due to liability reasons alone. If you kept secret, let's say a logging company uh, went to do rural work in Alaska and somebody was injured by a Sasquatch or killed by a Sasquatch and the government had kept its existence a secret that would be a negligent homicide it would be almost fraudulent and so sooner or later with all the sightings coming in with with even police making reports and sheriffs and US marshals and Canadian mounted police all making reports about this and some of them even filming the creature then then sooner or later they have to come clean but they never come clean as you know it in a full disclosure fashion they always leave it up some mystery in the in the mixed keep it a gray area it's rather incredible that we don't see full disclosure but you know when you've been lying about it for so long full disclosure would be like disclosing how dishonest you've been which is why the UFO phenomenon is being leaked bits by bits without a full disclosure the so an amazing story in these journals some people say it's a hoax that somebody journaled these two different journals uh, to match but the, the detail the, the the scientific anatomical terminology is all master's level and PhD level terminology. In fact, it, the terminology I can't even accurately pronounce. And coming from me, that's saying a lot. So uh, I, I just don't find it that somebody with that intellect would sit around and for days write out fake journals from two different people that corroborate the story, but yet bring to highlight differences in their theories upon evolution of the species and what an incredible story this guy talked about um, one struck by lightning and a tree fell on it um, he talked about how the body was flown to his office in Colorado uh, he talked about how he was corroborating with other governments confidentially about their human like primates that they were also having similar experiences with. So, so what, it's an amazing story for H.A. Miller and, and his associate. 
people say that she was citizen of Texas. And, but to me, it, it would be a clever hoax and with no known motive because nobody's gotten rich off that hoax. So if you want to call it a hoax, generally there's a money trail and a, and a conflict of interest somewhere. So the Mount St. Helens story is, is just fascinating. It's hard to believe. Uh, they talk about people in the U.S. Armed Forces being able to communicate effectively with uh, these animals. Of course, we know now DNA evidence. It, it, you can't send it to federal labs. You have to go to independent labs to get the DNA uh, analyzed. And the, the analysis so far uh, comes up with you know 95 to 98 percent human DNA, if not more. So both Dr. Miller and his counterpart were wrong. They they said this was animal was mostly primate. Again, basing their their best conclusions upon physical characteristics and regional characteristics geographically and not upon DNA and he wrote that they had a plan they had target dates by which they were going to designate refuges wildlife refuges where Sasquatches are officially protected by law and those some of those did come to fruition uh, Yakima and Washington State once had very severe penalties if you were to shoot a Sasquatch, giving people more of a right to self-defense. And indeed, um, you, you cannot disarm people before they're attacked by a wild animal, which you're keeping secret. So Washington took their felony law and downgraded it to misdemeanor. Um, they took the $10,000 fine and, and reduced that. There was a maximum of a $10,000 fine. There was jail time involved. So they, they decriminalized the killing of Sasquatch. So the fact that those, those laws and the refugee, I say refugee, but the refuge declarations, those match what Miller and his counterpart had written in paper, on paper. The, we do see, even in Colorado, uh, we see some legislation in some counties that protect hypothetical Sasquatches. We see road signs or a Sasquatch crossing done on government material, on government property, with signs that are, are done in the same colors that government signs are done in. Sasquatch crossing. In the forestry and hiking literature based on the, the st each state's own forest services, they have what to do and recommendations. If you see a Sasquatch, if you see one on foot, or if you see one in your car, what should you do? So they, they say it's very important to keep your windows very clean. So these things are hard to see at night. Um, but also it, it helps you knowingly identify what you're looking at. So, so stay tuned for the Mount St. Helens story. And just... A note of interest the we're not posting this will be the only posting of a Sasquatch video that will be made public on YouTube we already produced one Sasquatch story an analysis or the rush excuse me the Russian nine the that were all killed up on a mountain called Death Mountain by the way um, we did that video and com and found other comparisons to other stories of such violence that, that's not the only story we talked about how each and every time except for maybe one instance there was always a reference to a high-pitched whistle and I just found a fifth reference to a high-pitched whistle and a violent creature now people are intimidated by the howls but there's they said the whistle was very eerie and it always has been associated with humans being dismembered and violently murdered. So that video is available on Patreon. This video, of course, will be Patreon first. This will be the only YouTube video 
because I want you to know that we're planning on making at least one investigation per month into the phenomenon of Bigfoot. So the only way you're really going to find out exactly all the work we're doing on the Sasquatch phenomenon because it too is a disclosure process just like UFOs right now where government is actually releasing what was once declassified evidence. And the same applies to Bigfoot. And if we don't reward the Patreon audience for the donating and helping us with the research, then, then I, you know, what would be the benefit of even subscribing to that channel when half the videos have to go up on a public forum anyway? So, so in order to reward the Patreon subscribers, we're going to be devoting an entire season to Sasquatch research and paper trails and real evidence. We're going to do that all year long, and and uh, it's only going to be for those people. And and this video, this public video, was first viewed and previewed for the Patreon subscribers. They got the first billing, so to speak. So this will be the the only Bigfoot video that will be so so just to be clear the only people getting to visualize the physical evidence we will be presenting regarding the Sasquatch phenomenon the only people that are going to be privy to that information will be the patreon subscribers and that's just a huge huge thing that we can do for their support um, and to reward them and to thank them personally